The popular image of the clan as we often think about it is fundamentally created by Griffith's Birth of a Nation. Uh, that is the film that creates the image of the white hood and robes that then gets adopted by the second clan. The clan didn't make the film Birth of a Nation, but it used it to great effect. One of their major recruitment techniques was they would go into a new town, they would have a showing of the film, and you'd have to remember that for most people, film was very new and very thrilling in the early 1920s. I'm sure many, many people had never seen a film before until they saw this. Furthermore, the Klan would charge money for people to come and see the film. In a small town, this could be a really major, uh, exciting event. The Birth of a Nation is considered the first Hollywood blockbuster. More than 50 million Americans went and sat in awe at this racist film. For most viewers, the spectacular battles, Lincoln's assassination, and of course, the Klan's heroic victories were seen as truth. It was a narrative fiction film that D.W. Griffith had constructed specifically to convey the idea of historical authenticity, that he has title cards drawing on quotes from popular academics and historians to try to convey the idea that this was the truth of Reconstruction. And it was a truth that was widely accepted at the time. This movie was seen as, in effect, telling the story of the South after the Civil War. Um, and so it really becomes the predominant way that people in America understand uh, Southern history, and, and which, of course, is bound up in our national history. African Americans organized to fight back against this propaganda. The NAACP, a group created to defend their rights, tried to get the film banned, and some cities boycotted it. But people in power remained unmoved. Griffith's work was the first feature film to be shown at the White House for a sitting president, the Democrat Woodrow Wilson. We think of uh, Woodrow Wilson as being essentially a progressive president. Uh, but when Birth of a Nation was shown in a private showing in the White House to Woodrow Wilson, he infamously said, it's like writing history with lightning. That's how incredibly good this movie was. President Wilson praised it. He, he thought it was great. He was absolutely a, a racist and a segregationist. Uh, that doesn't mean that he would necessarily have approved of Klansmen going around and lynching people. It's also important to understand that Wilson was himself a Southerner. He depended on votes from the South for his position. In the South, you had basically an electorate that was only white, and Woodrow Wilson could not afford to contradict them. So Wilson's essentially endorsement uh, of Birth of a Nation and therefore of the idea of the Klan uh, helped to popularize the Klan enormously. The Birth of a Nation gave the Klan a nationwide audience. Joseph Simmons was ambitious. He understood that his little business had a big future. That meant advertising. So the Grand Wizard hired two marketing experts. Elizabeth Tyler and Edward Clark. The two advertising specialists understood how to help the organization make money. They concocted a pyramid scheme. If I recruit you to be a member of the Klan, uh, I can keep 40%, 4-0, of your initiation fee. You can then go and recruit him, and you can get his 40%. And that goes on and on until you run out of people to recruit. And the initiation fee at the beginning was $10. And $10 is worth well over $120 today. This is not an organization of poor people. 
There is a business to the clan, and it's called clan members. You pay a membership fee, and all the money that you pay every month, your dues, go to the Imperial Wizard, and he uses that money to travel around and party with everybody at these damn clan lighting ceremonies, these cross light ceremonies. It pays his bills. He uses it to buy alcohol. He just, he doesn't work. He doesn't have a job. We have jobs. It's just a scam, man. The whole thing is a scam. They built this up. They also uh, forced the clan members uh, to rent their robes. You were not allowed to sew your own robes and so on. They standardized the robes as these white sheets that we see today with the cross with the blood drop on the front and so on. And ultimately, the clan grew incredibly quickly. The sermons, meetings, and nighttime ceremonies drew in more and more people. In just a few months, the group went from 2,000 to 300,000 members. At $10 to join, the clan became rich and powerful. Starting with its imperial wizard, His Majesty William Joseph Simmons. Well, for a while in the 1920s, uh, the Klan was exceedingly powerful and had a great deal of money. Uh, William Joseph Simmons, for instance, the first leader of the Second Era Klan, lived in a, a multi-million dollar mansion. So for a while, with all of these dues coming in, uh, it was incredibly successful. The new world was changing, and the fears of the Protestant majority did too. You need to move with the times. The Klan grew its business of hatred. In addition to hating black people, the Klan adopted anti-immigrant, anti-urban, anti-communist, anti-Semitic, and anti-Catholic positions. It claimed all sorts of virtues for itself and naturally advocated for prohibition. The colonists were essentially Protestants. Uh, so all the way, you know, they came from Europe with their prejudices against Catholics, uh, so-called papists. They didn't really care about the United States. If the Pope told them to go shoot the president, they would do that because they were all loyal slaves of the Pope. So there was that idea. There was the idea that they drank too much, right? They actually used wine in the communion service. Um, and this is, of course, at a time uh, when prohibition has just been passed. So Catholics were associated very strongly with alcohol. Also, Catholicism was connected to essentially poorer, darker-skinned countries in Europe. So, you know, what they thought of was they thought of the Greeks and the Portuguese and the Spaniards and the Southern Italians. Uh, and at that time, those people were not really viewed as white. They're not really white, they're just kind of white. The organization grew spectacularly, as did its bank account. The group became one of the most important political organizations in the country. It spilled out of its southern base and flooded the rest of the country. On August 8, 1925, more than 40,000 members paraded down Pennsylvania Avenue. It was a huge show of strength. They were not afraid of showing their faces. And their new leader, Hiram Evans, was at the march too, as if there were nothing to hide. The invisible empire had never seemed so powerful. Estimates put clan membership at somewhere upward of four million members, which was a really significant proportion of the country's population, especially when we consider all of the groups who were excluded from joining the clan. You were only allowed to become a clan member if you had been born in the United States, if you were white, and if you were a Protestant. And so when we think about it, uh, narrowing the population down along those lines, four million members is a terrifyingly large percentage of that population. As the cameras focused on the march, another scene was taking place off screen. Lobbyists for the Klan were working overtime in the background. Their influence on American political life was considerable. 
In the 1920s, the Invisible Empire got 11 governors, 75 representatives, and 16 senators elected. Harry Truman, the future American president, admitted in his memoirs that he had briefly belonged to the Klan in his youth for electoral reasons. When we say that someone like Harry Truman was a member, you have to remember this was a completely respectable thing to be. Many places, people joined the Klan because it, it brought them status. It was a highly respected community organization. Furthermore, the Klan chapters, the Claverns, functioned uh, to do what we today call networking. You meet other people. You meet people who might be your customers or who could give you a job or you could do a business deal with. There was an awful lot of uh, economic uh, incentive to be a part of the Klan in certain locations. The Klan was powerful enough to make or break a career. At the Democratic National Convention of 1924, it blocked the nomination of candidate Al Smith. For two good reasons. Smith was a Catholic and an opponent of prohibition. But the Klan's greatest victory was getting a draconian immigration law passed. The Klan helped to pass the Immigration Act of 1924, which for the first time created a, a, an immigration quota system in the United States that extremely much favored Northern European whites. In other words, people from Germanic countries uh, and the United Kingdom. So from 1924 until 1965, uh, when the immigration system was reformed, uh, the United States uh, essentially had a clan devised immigration system which limited more or less uh, immigration to the United States to so-called Aryans. Soon the clan's connections had extended everywhere, including the cultural landscape of the Roaring Twenties. It produced its own music, which it put out and played on its own radio stations. The organization owned its own newspapers, like The Fiery Cross and The Searchlight, which published the positions of its leaders, always anti-black, anti-Catholic, and anti-Semitic. The announcers heeded the call. The KKK was king of the hour. Ads recommended the junior KKK for 12 to 18 year olds and pushed the accessories that all good clansmen needed to own. The organization sponsored plays written in its own honor, and it even financed films to promote its activities. The secret society had never been so visible. They are holding rodeos and jousting tournaments. They are appearing in popular novels. They are in popular films. They are in popular music. They are on the radio and they are selling you newspapers on the street corner. And so they really become a major part of American cultural life. The faction society sold well. The Klan was everywhere. Its hooded figures appeared in animated and short films. Even Harold Lloyd, performed escaping from their clutches in his extraordinary adventures. In 1924, it even appeared in one of the first short films produced by Walt Disney, in which kids mimic secret society members.
The Klan was by far the biggest social movement of the 1920s. And it was not only a mass organization with somewhere between three and six million people, but it was a family organization with activities for children, for young women, for young men. Klan events in the 1920s were very much family affairs. Uh, people brought their wives, they brought their children, uh, you know, and, and there was a kind of festival atmosphere to much of it. They had these giant, giant picnics. Uh, we're talking about picnics to which 25,000 people came. And there were games with prizes. There were beauty contests. There were brass bands playing. There were dances. And you would get the impression that I certainly got that in many places, a family could spend their whole lives surrounded by other clanspeople. The, there were particular scripts for clan funerals, for clan weddings, for the christening of children. They were really part of the fabric of daily life for a lot of white Protestant people. At the same time that the Klan was hosting wholesome activities by day, its crimes continued in the shadows. had managed to do the unthinkable. It had become respectable. And its grand wizard even graced the cover of Time magazine. I think the most important thing to understand, and perhaps the most frightening thing, is that they were, they had achieved a certain kind of respectability. They were viewed by many people as a legitimate, uh, fraternal political group in the United States. 